thanks everyone for being here. This is the last part actually of our female founders program that we've been running over the last 12 months, um, funded by the Queensland government through Advanced Queensland. Um, it's been a really exciting program where we've got to work with around about 100 female founded startups all around Queensland. Um, it's been exciting to see the journeys that a lot of those entrepreneurs have been on over that, that period of time. Uh, we've worked with them through our mentoring programs, through our pre-accelerator, uh, doing some investment readiness coaching, um, and also uh, as, as um, part of this webinar, we're, we're really just trying to engage more widely with the community across Queensland in terms of uh, finding people who have got um, business ideas that they're working on, whether they're still at the idea stage or if you've made a start and have, have um, launched something, uh, we're really keen to see if we can find ways to support you as you grow your businesses. Um, so let me get started. I, I should actually say, housekeeping point, we're recording this webinar and we're going to share it widely. Um, it'll be on the Startup on Ramp website and it'll also be uh, probably on the Advanced Queensland website. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, if you have any questions, we're going to try and allocate some time at at least a couple of points throughout this session for questions, uh, comments, um, and each of our speakers will will try and leave some time free for that. So if you do have a question um, at the end of each um, presentation, can you please use the um, raise hand button at the bottom of your Zoom screen? Uh, and we'll uh, try to get to as many as we can in the time that we've got. So uh, just a, a couple of things to say before we get underway. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're meeting today and to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the support of Advanced Queensland uh, through their Accelerating Female, Female Founders program, uh, which has made it possible for us to deliver this program over the last 12 months. Um, and we're one of a number of, of organizations that Advanced Queensland has supported to deliver female founders focused programs over that period of time. Uh, we've got three speakers who are going to talk today. I'm going to lead off. Um, I'm Colin Kinner. I'm the CEO and founder of Startup OnRamp. Um, we're a um, early stage program uh, to provide training and mentoring for entrepreneurs. We've been running for about seven years. We've supported about 2,000 startups over that period of time. Uh, we're Queensland-based, so a lot of them are in Queensland, and we've had the um, absolute pleasure of, of working with some really amazing entrepreneurs over the last seven years. Um, I'm then, then going to introduce Renee Dembowski, who's the founder of Content Monarchy, and she's going to talk about her journey as an entrepreneur. Um, thanks for being here uh, tonight, Renee. And then finally, I'll introduce Myron Eibner, uh, who's the customer engagement lead for SheMaps. Um, Myron's got a, a wealth of experience in working with cohorts of entrepreneurs through several programs that no doubt she'll, she'll tell you about when we get to it. So um, I thought I might just talk a little bit about startups to set the scene. Well, it's always good to start with definitions. Um, so I'm going to start briefly with a quick definition um, and then maybe talk about some things that are likely to be uh, factors that lead to success in startups and then talk about factors that lead to failure. Of course, everyone wants success, so we'll we'll um, we'll hopefully um, cover some useful points. So, at a really simplistic level, a startup is something that we can define as a young, high growth company that's using technology and innovation to serve a large, often global market. This is actually a definition from Startup Oz, which is a peak body that was established in Australia to to advocate and and support uh, the whole startup ecosystem uh, nationally. And so there's a couple of, of key bits of this that we might that we might pull apart. Um, one way that I like to do that is to plot businesses on a pyramid. And so this is a, a really simplistic way, but I think it's helpful of showing different kinds of businesses. So on the horizontal axis, you've got the number of companies at the bottom of the of the pyramid. You've got a very large number of companies and at the pointy end. You've got a much smaller number. And as you go vertically up the pyramid, you go from businesses that have a relatively small potential in terms of the size that they can grow to. And at the top of the pyramid, you've got businesses that have got enormous potential. So I think, you know, Canva, Facebook, Atlassian, companies like that. Um, the companies that we're really interested in and, and that I think I, I would encourage everyone to, to try and think about is 
the, the top third of this pyramid. So these are the ones that they don't all have to be technology companies. They can be product companies. They can be service companies, but they're businesses that have the capacity to grow. And, and one of the reasons I think this is really interesting is that the level of difficulty in starting a small business or an SME um, is not a lot different to the level of difficulty of starting something that can grow a lot more. So if you're going to put in, you know, probably years of your life and an incredible amount of time and effort, you might as well do that and and reap the rewards by building something that can grow. Um, small businesses and SMEs are really important. You know, we 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 need plumbers and tradies and coffee shops and um, you know bookkeeping firms. But I think um, most likely the reason that we're all here um, this afternoon is to think about you know ways that we can build something that can grow. So a couple of themes I wanted to talk about. Um, the first of those is to to just cover five or so things that, that make startups succeed. So as I mentioned, Startup on Amps worked with a couple of thousand companies over the last seven and a bit years. And there's been some really common themes. If you look at which the companies that have succeeded, what are the things that they've done in common that have led them to succeed? And there's been a lot written about this. So I'll try and summarize a few key points. Um, the first is to build something that is scalable. So by scalable, let's let's look first at what's not scalable and then we'll look at what is scalable. So not scalable is when you're delivering a, a service or, an, or a product to a customer where the revenues are capped typically by virtue of the number of hours in a day. So let's take a, a classic example. If, if you run a bookkeeping service, you know, you've got 24 hours in a day, um, seven days in a week. Um, only some of those are, are available for working. Um, so you're only going to generate so much revenue before you basically used up all your available time. Um, if you run your business efficiently, your costs will be less than your revenues and you'll make a profit. Um, but this is the sort of business that if you're selling time or you're selling a service, it's very difficult to scale it beyond those available working hours. You can employ more people, but you still have the same shape of this kind of growth curve that says, well, you can increase the revenues because you've got more people doing the work and, and, and billing their time, but you've also got higher costs. So nothing wrong with this sort of business, but it's not scalable. Scalable looks like this. So this is where you have revenues that are really quite disconnected from the costs. And this can be seen very clearly in some software businesses, but also in businesses that have a physical product where you can get economies of scale by, by getting to large production volumes. Um, I'll give you a really quick example of this. Um, this is going back a few years to, for those of you who used to play Facebook games, um, this is a game called Fishville that was on Facebook. It was released by a company called Zynga, and it was basically an aquarium. <clears throat> and so in this game, you controlled the little characters in the aquarium. They'd swim around, and you could you know, get them to interact with each other. It's pretty simple. Um, I was talking to one of the designers that created the clownfish, this little character on the screen. And this designer said, well, we realized that we could monetize some of the characters in the game. So what we did was we said, well, you can play the game for free, <clears throat> but if you want to have a clownfish, which is everyone's favorite character, you got to pay 99 cents. And so they said, great, we'll, we'll charge people 99 cents and we'll, you know, a few people might buy the clownfish and we'll see how it goes. And over the, the next couple of years, when people played this game, Zynga sold $29 million worth of clownfish. So you think of, think of this as a digital asset. So it's a thing that you know, probably took a designer or a small team of designers a couple of days to design and code and create the logic that said if it bumps into the, you know, the shark, it swims in the other direction. Um, and for, for that fairly modest amount of effort, they generated $29 million in revenue. So that's that's kind of what I think of as the extreme end of scalable. So the next um, common theme that you can see if you look at successful companies um, is that they have decided to be a painkiller rather than a vitamin. Um, you might have heard this expression before. There's a couple of ways of thinking of it. I, I think of it as, um, for those of you that remember the Muppets, <clears throat> it's it's the hair on fire problem. So if your product is a bucket of water and your customer has, figuratively speaking, their hair on fire, then they will run to get your product. They're not going to walk. They're going to say, give me that bucket of water. So the thing that leads to a lot of, of really interesting um, products and services for customers is where the entrepreneur says, I'm going to solve a problem where it's so acute for my target customer that they will really, really want to solve it. 
Like, so that's that's the distinction between a painkiller and a vitamin. Um, so people talk about customer pains. They talk about um, you know solving something that's really important. Um, just a quick example of this. There's lots of of kind of digital products that you could say are solving real pain points, but um, this is one that, that I, I reckon is pretty interesting. Um, so for anyone who who's seen one of these before, this is a CPAP machine. It's for people who suffer from sleep apnea. Um, there are millions of, of people around the world who use these devices. And fundamentally, the value proposition from, from the companies that make these products is a couple of things. So one is they give you better sleep, right? So if people who suffer from mild sleep apnea typically don't get very good sleep and they feel terrible pretty much all the time. And so this helps you to improve your sleep. So that's a really strong value proposition. And I'd say that that in itself would put this as a painkiller rather than a vitamin product. But for people who suffer from severe sleep apnea, it's actually saving their lives. So there are people who are at risk of dying in their sleep, quite literally, because of severe sleep apnea. And so having a device like this, even though it's not very glamorous, actually the value proposition to those customers is that this could stop you from dying. So you know, not every product or every service can have a value proposition that says we're going to stop you from dying. But I think if you look at this as kind of an example of, you know, how strong is the impetus from the customer to want to get your product, this is a nice way of thinking of it and saying, well, all right, well, whatever my product or my service or my offering is, how can I be really sure that I'm building something that my target customers really, really want or need so that you know, they will they will actually be highly motivated to pay money to have access to that. So the third common attribute of successful companies that I want to talk about is testing your assumptions. And, and I, th I think probably um, Renee and Byron might also have some things to say about this topic because it's really important. Um, testing your assumptions means instead of at, at one end of the spectrum, instead of saying, I'm going to put every last cent that I've got and I'm going to work you know, for the next two years on this product or this idea, whatever it might be, and I'm going to launch it, it says, well, what if you're wrong about some important part of that? What if you haven't got quite the right product or the right offering? Or what if your customers actually don't want it as, as much as you think? It would be really valuable if you could test some of your assumptions quickly and cheaply really early on so that you're not getting to that point, as a lot of startups do, that they realize way too late after they've spent an incredible amount of time and money that their product or their service doesn't actually meet a real need or it's not as compelling as they thought it would be. Um, so there's a couple of really simple uh, tools that you can use. This is one that, that we uh, work with a lot of founders to, to put in place and it's basically a, an assumption mapping matrix. And what it does is it, it says all of the assumptions behind your business could be plotted on a on a little two by two matrix where the vertical axis is how important is this assumption. So an important assumption means this really has to be true. Otherwise, our business just won't make sense. It's not going to be successful. And on the other end of that continuum, you've got trivial, right? So that's an assumption we say, well, it's an assumption that we've made. If it turns out to be true or not true, it probably doesn't really make a big difference. Then on the horizontal axis, you've got how much we know about this. And so on the right-hand side, you've got highly unknown. So this basically says we have no real data to base our assumption on. All we're doing is taking a, a guess. And on the other end, you've got something that you know, and it could be because you've got experience in that industry. It could be because you've been the customer yourself, or it could be that you've gone and interviewed a whole bunch of customers who've told you this. Um, the, the key point of this is that once you've captured a whole lot of your assumptions, and you can do it with post-it notes if you know, if you've got a team, you can all sit around a whiteboard or, or you know, get a, get a big bit of butcher's paper. It doesn't matter how you do it. But when you capture your assumptions, it can be really helpful to then say, right, which ones are really important and really unknown? And what can we do to test them and do that really early on? And if you, if you do that, what, you, what you're actually achieving is you're saying, well, we're going to take away as much of the risk as possible before we spend a lot of time and a lot of money. I'll just show you really quickly a, um, uh, a chart that kind of illustrates how this works in practice. So this is, this is um, uncertainty and investment over time. 
So time on the horizontal axis, uncertainty is the blue bit. So uncertainty is, you know, how much of a, of a, a wild guess are we taking about whether this business will work? And investment is your investment. So this is, this is your time, your money, um, you know, whatever else you're putting into this business. <clears throat> and so the whole idea here is to start off in a search phase. So they talk about search and execution being two phases of a business. And so the search phase basically says, we're going to spend as little time and as little money as we can to test some of our assumptions really early on so that we can reduce that uncertainty as much as possible. And once you've done that, you can then make a, a better informed decision that says, it's now actually a good idea to, to ramp up that investment of time and money and maybe bring in other people's money if, if that's what you want to do to, to fund your business, whether that's grant money or investors or whatever. So that's the execution phase. So the, the, one of the things that I've seen lots and lots of people um, get wrong in, in the early days of their business is to go from idea straight to execution. Instead of saying, well, it's actually a really good idea to spend some time in the search phase where it's not costing us a lot of time and a lot of money, but we're doing as many of those kind of quick and cheap um, validation experiments or, or um, activities that we can do to, to identify and test some of those assumptions. So hopefully that makes sense. We, we might come back to some of this if we have any time for um, the questions at the end. Um, another couple of quick ones. Uh, go for a big opportunity. There's no point in building a business if your target market is left-handed neurosurgeons. Um, uh, so, so you know you might as well go for as big an opportunity as you can. The, the way I like to think of it is with reference to um, this, which is the Google toothbrush test. Uh, if you've ever come across this, it's the test that Google uses and has done for, for a lot of time um, when they're building a new product. They basically have an internal decision process that says, will just about everyone on the planet use this product twice a day? Now, not every business can can do this as literally as Google and say, well, we're only going to build a product if, <clears throat> you know, if everyone on the planet will use it. But it's an interesting thought process that says, well, why would we put all of this time and effort into creating this product or this service if we're not really confident that there's a really, really big market out there? So, so I like the approach. I, I, I'd never say go literally for the every person on the planet, um, but I like the approach of saying go really big. Um, I want to contrast that with the next one, which is actually almost saying the opposite. So this one is about um, making your customers really happy, but focusing really specifically on a narrow group of customers for whom you can actually deliver real value early on, even though your product might still be immature or your service might still be um, you know, under development. So the way I think of this is that you can optimize for user happiness. And so I'm a big fan of charts. If you haven't uh, uh, noticed already, I love my charts. Um, on this chart, we're plotting users or customers on the horizontal axis and their satisfaction on the vertical axis. And all we're saying here is that when you start out and you first launch something into the market, you could go after lots and lots of users, different types of users, you know, um, uh, different demographics, uh, different price points, different um, product features. You could do that, and a lot of people do, but what they typically find is that some of those users are really, really happy with what you've delivered, and most of them aren't. They kind of go, eh, it's not quite what I wanted, but it's okay. Whereas if you do the opposite and you say, well, we're only going to try and target a very narrow band of users, but they're the ones that our, our first version of our offering, whatever it is, they're going to they're going to find it really, really valuable. Then what you're doing is you're making those users really happy those customers really happy, you're encouraging them to be an advocate for your business because you're going to get good you know, uh, reviews, whether that's on Google or Facebook or wherever, you know, depending on the kind of business that you've got. They're going to share it with other people. So you're going to have that kind of word of mouth referral and, and um, I hate the word virality, um, but you, you get my point. You know, that it's that kind of inherent shareability. In contrast, if you have a whole bunch of somewhat unhappy users or even kind of, you know, five out of tens, um, they don't share it. They don't talk about it. Um, they leave crappy reviews on Google and Facebook and wherever else. And you end up having a whole, a whole lot more difficulty growing your user base or your customer base. So I'll give you a really quick example. 
Um, this is a company that I really like. Uh, it's called Boosted Boards. They're an electric skateboard company um, actually based in the US. Um, I got to try out one of these electric skateboards. They go 40 kilometers an hour. Um, so they're pretty, pretty scary uh, things to get on if you're, um, if you're not a skateboarder. Anyway, what Booster did was they said when they launched the first version of their electric skateboard product, they basically said, we will not sell this to anyone unless they can demonstrate that they're already a pretty good skateboarder. And that seemed like a kind of a crazy thing to do because you're actually they were turning away customers who weren't skateboarders and said, oh, I'd like to try that. And they said, no, no, we're not going to sell it to you. And what they did was they basically ensured that the first few thousand people that bought their skateboard really, really got value from it. They could ride it straight away. They didn't all crash and you know break their arms and legs. Um, and they raved about it because when you're a good skateboarder, you can immediately get all of the kind of fun and, and satisfaction from using this thing. And, and it spread really quickly. They then broadened it out and, and they they had like a slower version. And then they introduced scooters that, you know, the people who weren't good skateboarders could ride, all that kind of thing. Uh, but I thought that was a, a kind of a nice practical um, real world example. Okay, um, I said I'd, I'd give you five things that uh, successful companies have in common. Uh, so this is the sixth one, uh, learn how to pitch. Um, so pitching just means explaining the, the value proposition behind your company. It can be pitching to a customer or to a new employee or to your bank manager or to an investor. Uh, it could be pitching to the government if you're applying for a grant. Um, but basically pitching is, is communicating the value. Um, I thought I would just share one really simple template that I find is quite helpful. It's called the Gaddy pitch. It was um, developed by someone called Anthony Gaddy, who's a sales coach. And he basically has three statements. And the first statement says, you know how, and then this is where you fill in the blanks that say, well, this is something about our target customer and this is the problem that we're solving for them and why it's a hair on fire problem or a you know painkiller rather than a vitamin. The second statement starts with, well, what we do is, and this is where you can say, well, we solve the problem by, this is our product or our service, this is our offering, and this is the benefits. And then the third statement is in fact. And so this is where you can insert some examples or some evidence that says, well, this is a great opportunity because of, you know, we interviewed a hundred customers and they all said they want the product or whatever. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a crack at this. Every business can use this. Um, some people find it works really well if you're in a you know conversation with someone or at a networking event and they say, oh, tell me about your business. Um, this is a a uh, nice little format to try. So I encourage you to, to have a crack at that. I'll make these slides available um, as well, just so if anyone wants to, to grab them afterwards. Uh, seventh out of five is um, seek out smart money. And so a lot of companies need to raise money from external sources to be successful. And um, one of the things that, that I think makes a huge difference if you are raising money from investors is to find investors who can add value in terms of their expertise rather than just cash. So a little um, rule of thumb that I like is that smart involved money is better than dumb passive money, which in turn is better than dumb involved money. And, and what that means is, so the people, the person on the left there is Alicia McDonald, who's a partner at Airtree Ventures, which is one of Australia's leading venture capital funds. And so my point there is that if you have Alicia as part of your business, not only does Airtree bring capital that'll help you to grow, you get somebody who's got a huge amount of experience working with lots of other successful companies. So that's what I call smart money. Um, and involved means that they will actually roll up their sleeves and, and help you. Dumb passive money means you've you've got <clears throat> some money from a, you know, a rich auntie or some other family or friend. They're 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 putting some money in in your business and they're they're happy to help you, but they're not telling you how to run your business. They probably don't really have anything else, a lot to contribute, and that's fine. the The one to avoid is the dumb involved money. So this you often see this is people who who've been in business, maybe they're you know in property or in finance or something. <clears throat> they don't have any particular uh, experience that's relevant to your company, but they want to tell you how to run things. So that's the money that if you take. Uh, take money from those folks, um, you, you can have a whole lot of challenges. Anyway, that's a little rule of thumb. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I thought I might just quickly, um, before I hand on to Renee, I might just talk about some things that make startups fail. 
because again, having worked with a lot, a lot of startups over the years, there are a bunch of things that I see again and again that pretty consistently are unhelpful. And sometimes they'll lead to failure. Sometimes they'll lead to companies just not growing as, as fast as they otherwise would. So by a very long way, the biggest thing that leads um, startups or new businesses to fail is that their customers just don't care about their product or the service or whatever it is. And so um, it comes back to what I was saying before about testing your assumptions and validating that what you think is going to be really valuable to your target market is in fact really valuable in their eyes. And so there's a, a bunch of things that you can do to test that. And um, we, we might, if we get time, talk about some of those. Um, the first is first thing not to do, to be really clear, is ask your friends and family for feedback on your business or on, or on your business idea, unless they happen to have really relevant experience, of course. But generally speaking, if you ask friends and family whether your idea is any good or whether you should pursue it, you're going to get this kind of response that says, yeah, that's great. Love it. And they're trying to be helpful, but <clears throat> often what you need is the is the more um, dispassionate feedback from somebody who, who might say, yeah, no, that's really not going to work, and here's why. Okay, the second thing that you shouldn't do is copy another successful business. I see this a lot. Um, it's it's a uniquely Australian phenomenon. We tend to look at overseas businesses that have done really well and say, oh, I'm going to be the, the Uber of Queensland, or I'm going to be the, you know, insert other successful company name. Um, and, and and just make it a bit more niche. That generally doesn't work well. Um, just to illustrate the point, here's a, a dozen um, car parking apps developed over the years from going, going way back. Um, I've, I've done a lot of mentoring at Startup Weekends, and I reckon every Startup Weekend that I've been to, um, somebody has come up with the idea of, wouldn't it be great if there was an app so you could rent out your parking space out the front of your house or in your driveway and make a few extra bucks? So basically Airbnb for parking. Um, perfectly good idea, except there's hundreds of them. So, so that's, <clears throat> that's, that's a challenge. Um, the way I like to think of ideas and what ones make sense and what don't is to, to have a Venn diagram. Um, so here's here's my my favorite Venn diagram. So it's basically an intersect between the set of all things that sound like a crazy idea and the things that are in fact a good idea. And if you put these two sets together, what you find is that the best ideas for new businesses tend to sit in this often quite small intersect. So what this really means is that things that are that sound crazy and are in fact crazy, we, we you know that's obvious you, you don't want to do that um the ones that worry me are are these ones here it's the ones that are in fact a perfectly fine idea it's just that they are self-evidently a good idea right and the problem with that is that there's probably 100 other people at least working on something just like it so the best ideas very often are the ones that are of course a good idea fundamentally they're in the green circle but they sound crazy enough that most people would say, "I don't. I'm not going to do that. That doesn't. I don't see how that would work." And but if you have a, a, an insight that says, "Well, I know something maybe that others don't, and I've got a hunch that this might work, even though it sounds crazy," that is a really interesting starting point for business. Okay, um, I'll probably not say much about this one other than. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people that I meet who say, oh, "I don't want to tell you about my idea," or "I don't want to tell I don't want to tell anyone about my idea because they might steal it." In 20 years of working with with lots and lots of startup founders, I've not seen one instance where someone's business idea has been stolen by someone else. I'm not saying that it can't happen; it could, in theory, but it's extraordinarily rare. And you've got to balance the 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 small risk of someone stealing your idea with the reality that if you don't tell people what you're working on, you're depriving yourself of what might be really valuable feedback from people who could say, well, I've got some insights or I've got some, you know, some uh, suggestions that might be helpful to you. And so my rule of thumb is to always be pitching. Anytime you get an opportunity to pitch, whether it's to other entrepreneurs or to investors or to customers, always be out there telling them um, what, what it is you're working on. Um, don't compete with free. So this is another thing that I've seen lead a lot of startups to um, to go badly is where their product is perfectly perfectly good. Whatever it is that you know they're delivering, 
it's, it's perfectly good, but there's a free alternative that's almost as good. And so I'll give you a quick example. Uh, this was a, a company that launched a few years ago. It's called Backballs. And it's basically, it's a, a spine massage device. So it's two kind of firm rubber balls that are connected together and you roll them up and down the back of your, your you know, other side of your spine and it massages the, the tight muscles. Perfectly good idea. And, and, you know, they're selling them online for 40 bucks or whatever it was. Um, they sold a few, but then people did this and they said, oh, you know what? I could just put two tennis balls together. That's basically the same thing. That's next to free. Why would I spend 40 bucks when I can just grab a couple of tennis balls? And so people were, were posting videos going, oh, I've just found this awesome, you know, new thing. I've, I've put two tennis balls in a sock. So, so that's a, a really simple, practical example of competing with free and finding how hard it is. Um, just related to that, I'll, I'll just mention briefly the 10x rule. So this is the rule that basically says if you are competing with something that is free or close to free, whatever you're doing has to be at least 10 times better. Otherwise, it's it's not likely that people are going to pay for the, the thing that, that you're doing. A really quick example of that. Um, this is a whiteboard at a screen printing business. Um, I know the founder of this business um, uh, pretty well. And basically, this was their workflow. This is how they managed. It was a team of about 20 people that worked in this business, and they managed all of their incoming and outgoing orders for screen printing of various things. Um, it, it worked but it was really, really inefficient. And so the founder basically said, I could probably improve this by turning it into a software product so we can actually do away with all the you know, post-it notes and, and whiteboards. And so they created a product called Hoops and it's basically now used worldwide as, as the go-to um, workflow management tool for screen printing and similar businesses. So um, what they did was they said, well, it's got to be 10 times better than a whiteboard. And so they made the software, you know, much, much better, much more efficient, um, much more user-friendly. And so they've been a successful business as a result of that. Um, last one I'm, I'm going to talk about is um, not writing a business plan. Um, for those of you who, who like the idea of writing a business plan for your business, if you're building a, I don't know, <clears throat> an accounting firm, for sure, write a business plan because accounting firms are reasonably predictable and you can probably write a business plan that makes sense. Um, if you're doing something that's innovative and it's different to anything that's been started before, so back to our definition of a startup, it's new and innovative and using technology, um, writing a business plan is, is really just guessing about the future because you're doing something that by definition hasn't been done already. Um, so a quote that I like um, from the co-founder of Startup Weekend is that business plans are as good as following directions given by a blind chimpanzee. So um, it's kind of a useful exercise to write one, but you've, it, it's, it's useful because it forces you to think about your business, not because the document that you end up with actually really means much because it's just guessing about the future. Instead of writing a business plan, there are a bunch of things you can do. Um, these are just a couple of quick examples of tools that, that we um, recommend to people. And again, I'll, I'll circulate these slides so that you'll, you'll have them to refer back to. Um, some simple canvases like the value proposition canvas, the lean canvas, and the validation board. Um, we won't go into how to use them uh, in today's session, but they're super useful because they're effectively a business plan on one piece of paper. And so I'd certainly encourage you to, to have a look at those. Um, last really quick one. Assu don't assume that your team are all on the same page. We, we have... Um, so many instances that we've seen of startup founders where the team starts off on a journey working well together and then for a whole range of reasons um, things fall apart there are, there are differences of opinions and the teams break down um, so again something that I think is a useful one page exercise is is this which is a founder alignment exercise um, we use it with all of the teams that, that we work with um, you're welcome to, to grab it from the slides uh, later and all you do basically is you ask each each member of your team to complete in their own time a couple of quick questions about why they're doing this startup, what they're willing to put in, what they want to get out, and how they define success. And then you invite all of the members of your team to come together with their completed um, worksheet and discuss. And, and it can lead to some fascinating conversations. So um, 
maybe one to, to try if you have some some team members. Okay, um, I have probably gone uh, beyond my allocated time and, and I'm going to suggest that we hold off questions uh, un until the end so that I don't eat into um, the time allocated for our other two speakers. So um, maybe if there's, has anyone got any um, um, burning questions or anything that immediately kind of jumps out? Just bear in mind that you're on, on mute. You'll need to unmute if you do have something. No. Okay. Well, look, we'll hold off um, questions. I might at this point ask Renee Dembowski to, to um, come and talk about her journey as a startup founder uh, of a company called Content Monarchy. Renee, thanks for being here. Hello, um, thank you. <laughs> do you want to, are you, are you planning to um, share slides or just talk off the cuff? Uh, I can, I can share some slides. Oh, I haven't got slides as such, but I'm happy just to maybe show a background to the software if anyone doesn't understand how it works. Um, sure. I'll just go with the flow otherwise. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. So do you want me just to have a chat about my journey so far or? Yeah, yeah. yeah that'd be great. All right. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. I'm Renee Dembowski. Um, I'll start off with where I started. So I um, have a social media company called Social Butterfly Marketing, and it's a boutique social media marketing agency. Uh, I started it in 2013, and we offer things like social media strategy, implementation, digital ads, and I also do a lot of coaching and training for small business and a qualified trainer for the Diploma of Social Media Marketing. So um, through this work, especially the work I did consulting for government, I um, found that a lot of small businesses were really struggling to post consistently to their socials through lack of time and budget. They also got very frustrated. Uh, they knew they had to do it, so they would outsource to agencies and they, because it was such a big investment for them, they expected, they had unrealistic expectations of what was achievable. Um, I also started working with a lot of franchises and this is where I saw an opportunity for Content Monarchy. Um, with the franchises that I worked with, one of them in particular had 80 locations across Australia. And for our team, we found that um, the, the problem we were facing is that the franchisor um, gave the locations or the franchisees the freedom to post to their to their pages. However, they had to get their content approved because the franchisor had fear of their brand being uh, their reputation being ruined, grammatical errors, spelling errors, too much selling online, and just not understanding what's appropriate to post online. So we had these. 80 locations sending us up to 30 posts in a month, more sometimes, we would have to put those together, send them to the franchisor for approval. Usually the franchisor wanted to make changes. We'd go back to the franchisee. They'd then want to make changes. So by the time this went around about 10 or 20 times, half the offers were finished and there were new offers out and we've, we have wasted so much money. And the franchisee, they've got no time. They don't have the skills to run their own social media. They don't have the desire to. They um, don't, they usually have a really limited budget because they, um, the, the way they see it is that they're contributing to the National Marketing Fund. So why should they be spending more money to promote their businesses at a local level? That's the franchisor's job. Franchisor is marketing, but it's um, quite generic and often it gets soaked up with the capital cities. So that's how the smaller regions see it. Anyway, so as we're going through this, they're paying pittance for the job. And I thought to myself, I just can't keep going like this. So I ended up giving them a month's notice and saying, look, we can't continue on this budget. And I thought about it for a while and I thought everything we're doing, it's super manual, but very repetitive. So surely I can automate this process. So that's where we developed Content Monarchy. And so um, it's scalable. Essentially, we create, we, we have an agreement with the franchisor, we create content and that content gets approved by the franchisor and then it's made available to all of the franchisees and uh, they get 30 pieces of content a month. And the beauty of the software is that it's customised to that location. So no matter where they're located in Australia, their content has their business name, their landing page, their phone number, location-relevant hashtags. 
So um, it doesn't matter what their skill set is. They don't need to have any skills to use the software. They just need to know how to sign up and put their form information in and then select posts. So we're a partner with Facebook, Instagram, Google, and we've been approved with LinkedIn. We just haven't developed that um, feature yet. So these um, we've got plumbers using it. We've had disability workers using it. They're able to just jump into the software, pick a few posts, schedule it or post it live to those platforms. So we've had our first paying or proper paying customer for a year now, and they're a plumbing franchise. Their results that they got were really amazing. I was actually also pretty impressed with it myself. And so they agreed to do a testimonial for us from the franchisor perspective and the franchisee perspective. And since doing that, I feel like we've got a lot more interest. So yeah, that's where we're at. That's brilliant, Renee. Um, can, can I ask a question just to start off and others might have, have things they want to jump in with? Um, you're not a software developer, is that right? No, I wish I was. If I had my time again, that's what I would go back and do at school. <laughs> mm, yeah. So so what was the the kind of thought process around spending the money to go and hire a software developer? Because, you know, that can be an expensive process. How, how do you navigate that whole um, thing of, you know, how much should I invest in, in actually building the product? Yeah. So that's definitely the scariest part. Um, so I'm really fortunate that my social butterfly marketing, that business there is does really well. So that has funded uh, the development of Content Monarchy together with, I was successful with some grants early on. So just small ones, so $5,000, $10,000. I think that might've been about it actually. However, that helped me get kickstarted. Um, what I did find though is um, budget gets chewed up super quickly with development. And I've learned some lessons there. So um, I would suggest uh, when finding a developer, it's difficult to do, but be really clear about what your expectations are. And sometimes you can get bamboozled with the language they use. Developers don't really speak our language. So it's really hard to articulate, you know, for them to articulate what you're getting. And also there's unknowns. So sometimes um, they start the process and then problems occur and then they've got to go and research things and the hardest part is trusting the process because you you wouldn't have a clue if actually truly that's the case and that's why it costs so much or if they took a quarter of the time that they said they did but charged you for the time that they charged you for. So that was, I've had a couple of surprises there and that was really hard to take, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that happen a lot of times. It's a, it's yeah. a pretty big challenge. Um, I want to make sure everyone else has a, an opportunity to, to throw some questions at you. So um, does anyone else um, want to jump in with some questions or comments for Renee? Is anyone else working on anything where, where you've got to hire external contractors, software developers, or or anyone else to, to do stuff? A bit crackly. You were just dropping in and out a bit there, Samantha. I think we're going to struggle with your bandwidth by the sounds of things. So, you know, one slide that you had up before that I was like 100%, I agree with that slide. It was um, the number five, make customers very happy. So at the beginning, early on. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I was just thinking while we wait for Samantha. Um, so our product is still quite immature and I know mm -hmm. that, but it's doing what we need now. And um, I went through the Startup on Ramp program a little while ago. And I remember um, the guys through that saying, it's really easy to get caught up in people saying, oh, if it had this, then then we'd use it. If mm -hmm. I had this and, I, and then you go away, you spend all this money developing this thing, but there's been no commitment only to find out it's just talk. It's not really, you know, they didn't really mean that they would put their money on the line. But um, so I, that's one lesson is not overdeveloping it, prove, getting the MVP first. And then um, the making customers very happy. So we've only got a really small pool of paying customers now, but we've worked really hard to keep them happy, like going above and beyond. And in exchange, they've given us testimonials. And I feel like without that, we wouldn't be able to go further than what we are now. Yeah. 
yeah for sure um i've got a, another question here in the chat but i just want to see whether samantha's um able to have another go at hers uh, she might have oh yeah samantha do you want to have another go and see if we can hear you better this time hi colin can you oh that's good Whoa, My it's, it's dropping in and out for a new computer <laughs> um, let's have a go at it we'll see see how we go it's not great audio but you never know it might work maybe not i've got a question <laughs> sure Anna. Go ahead, Anna. Hi. Yeah. So, um, Samantha, we, we might, if you want to send your question as a text in the chat, maybe we'll be able to, to pick yours up. So can... um, yeah, so hi, Renee. Um, I just wanted to ask actually about your the success you um, experienced with getting your grants approved, um, what type of grants they were, and if you, if you have any um, tips or advice on um, you know how to how to have a successful outcome with a grant application i have got to admit the grants that, that i applied for they were um the adaption grant so you remember the COVID adaption grant and well it was actually really easy to get so um i think that's why i was successful with that one because i haven't i'm not i'm not someone who i would consider to be good at applying for grants I can't remember what the other one was for, but it was only a small one. I can go back and have a look at what they were and let you know if you like. Oh, was it the biz, bu business booster or something like that? I'll have a look. But they were very, very easy to apply for those ones. Okay. So it was just literally, you know, filling out the forms and yeah, waiting for the outcome. Pretty much. And I haven't okay. actually seen any recently because I've been keeping an eye out for anything else that pops up, but I haven't seen anything recently. Yeah. And where did you search your um, grants? The uh, business.gov website, I think it was, under small business grants. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Can I just add, and I'll, I'll put a note in the chat, the um, Queensland government has a um, grant program called Ignite, which has a bunch of different streams of grant funding that sit under it. Everyone should have a look at that. Um, they're... Broadly speaking, in the categories of early stage um, um, product development through to prototyping and, and market validation through to scaling up your business. Um, I'll, I'll have oversimplified it there, but if you look on that link that I've put in the chat, you'll see some info about them um, and they're round space. So worth having a look at. Um, I've got a question also here in the chat from Sam, which I, I might just read out um and renee it's it's probably i might ask you to 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 have a, a go at it first and um <laughs> see how we go so the question from sam is regarding the the point about don't copy another successful business should i stop because there are similar businesses operating in the us and europe but practically no active players in australia do you want to comment on that well i guess that i've had people say to me well, and I guess how similar, what's similar. So I've had people say to me, oh, but there's Hootsuite because Hootsuite's a, a scheduling platform or there's Canva. So they think of Canva as being similar, but we have some very um, unique differentiating things. Like it's ours is quite different to that, even though it, seem, it has got some similarities. So I would say how similar, what's the unique selling point with your software compared to the ones over in the US? But yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And the only thing I would add to it is that um, it's actually really good if there are other businesses that are already doing something a bit similar. Like I wouldn't, I totally would would agree with you. You don't want to be the, you know, the hundredth Hootsuite. You don't want to look exactly like things that are already out there, but you're just the Australian version of it. But on the other hand, if you're literally the only person in the world to come up with an idea it, you know, you've got to you've got to think through the logic and say, well, is it because literally nobody else on the planet has thought of this, 
or is it because a bunch of people have thought of it and decided it doesn't look like a very appealing thing to go and pursue or, or what's the reason? So it actually, for the most part, it's actually really helpful if you can see that there are some things already out there doing really well and you can kind of go, well, that's a, that at least demonstrates that there's demand. And then mm -hmm. if you can innovate a bit beyond that and say, well, I'll do something that's different enough that it's not just, you know, a knockoff of that, um, then that can be really helpful because, you, you know, you're kind of validating that there's demand out there. Mm. Uh, Thank you so much. That's really helpful. <laughs> no worries, Sam. Did that answer your question? Yeah, 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 it did. Absolutely. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, I can see Sarah's got a hand up the question. Do you want to? unmute Sarah and jump in yeah um that question and it's made me think of something that I'm struggling with um there are so mm, people have their own uh like they're aware of what's available right now right but if you're taking a completely I'm taking a, a completely different view and angle so it's based on something that communities love and everything, but there is definitely a gap in the market where there's a whole heap of people who are missing out entirely. So I'm producing an opportunity for them, mm -hmm. except for the fact that because everyone's so used to what is currently available, they can't see past that. And I've spent so, like 40 hours working out how to word what's on my web website. <laughs> And it's like people are still focusing on one teeny tiny little animal where that is not where my focus is, just because that is what they're aware of. So the biggest issue for me is combating that. Could you just give us a bit of context and describe at a high level what it is your business is? So um, I, um, I come from the disability community and... Um, and the performing arts in general. Um, uh, I know that a lot of the technology that's coming out hasn't really, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not great with technology, but then there's a lot of, there's a lot of elements, I guess, in the performing arts industry and the education um, uh, experience opportunities, workshops, like it's, it's quite a broad topic. And so um, when I have told people what I want to do and what I'm providing they then just focus on oh she's disabled so she just wants to provide you know some sweet little opportunities for disabled people that is definitely not <laughs> what I'm trying to do at all um, and even the disabled community they're so used to being told you can't that they're not even getting it when I explain it hmm. that's interesting and I, I, wonder... I wish I could hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, an exercise that I sometimes get people to do is to, when they've got a website, is to actually give it to someone, like actually sit next to them while they read what's on your website. And and it's it's quite hard to not say anything, but like literally say nothing, ask them to just read and then say, right, now tell me about my business and and use that as an opportunity to figure out what bits of this, of the content on your website by giving them that kind of wrong impression or or, you know, inaccurate understanding and try and zoom in on that and go right mm. which bit of it when you got to which bit of it told you that and and you know it doesn't always um, work with just one person you might need to get multiple people in a room and, and do it you know or do it one at a time and it, it can be a really interesting way of going ah well it says this but you've interpreted it as that and and that might be enough just to say right well i need to change the way that we we express that it's so hard because you've got the way that disabled community um, function in life and see things through that and then you've got everybody else and, there's, you know, it's very difficult. So I've specifically put in a mission and a vision statement and all of that stuff. And uh, But it's also, it's not just the website, it's also when I'm speaking with people. Hmm. They can say, hey, I'm interested. Can we have a phone call so we can discuss this? And then we discuss it. And so I specifically say, but just because the word disabled is there, everyone's brains instantly go to mm. the shitty opportunities and, you know, situation that the disabled community are in. And that's not. And so as soon as that word comes up, that's it. Everyone's brains, you know, go to that shut down on that one thing. <laughs> yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I wish I had a, a, a better answer. Um, it's a tough one. No, there's, but I will do that. Of... I'll do that website. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Renee, did you want to add anything on that? I reckon exactly what you said because the way I explain it, I've I've really struggled with articulating my product. And and even now, I, it, I change the way I explain it depending on who I'm talking to. But um, the thing that actually helped me really clarify it the way I pitch it is my customers who have been using it. So when they did the testimony or the language they used, I'm like, oh, they just said it in a way that other people like them will understand it, not in the way that I think it should be explained. So even if you know someone who understands what you do and they're using what you do, even if it's somebody who's using it for free, maybe ask them to articulate or explain what the, it is and then take their words. Yes, oh. good idea. I did that once with some music I wrote. It, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Thank you. That's all right. <laughs> Thanks, Renee. Um, got another question from, is it Sarah or Sarah? It's Sarah. Hello, Sarah. everyone. Hi. So I just pulled over. I'm actually driving, so I thought, I'd listen to you guys while I uh, was on the road this afternoon. So I'm a bit further ahead. I'm already on the market and getting revenue in. Um, I just had a question for you, Renee. So I'm in the male fertility industry. So we've developed a, a men's underwear to help keep the testes cool, to optimise sperm health. Um, and as a startup, obviously, marketing spend is very low. We can't target people through Facebook ads or anything because it's the health sector. I was just asking, wondering if you had any advice on where we should be prioritising the little budget or uh, no budget <laughs> into trying to target people that are trying to conceive. Because, um, yeah, Facebook ads and things like that are definitely not my friend at the moment. Okay, yeah. And there's no way that you can um, creatively advertise them without claiming any medical? I can advertise them, but then I'm spraying and shooting and just, no, it's going to, I can't, the whole point of using Facebook ads is to, you know, target, be precise with the target market. Um, but because of the sector that I'm in, being in health, you can't target that type of sector. So it just goes through a lot of people that it's not uh, who are my customers, essentially. They're not people that are struggling with, with fertility. So probably uh, what I would do is I would, first of all, I mean, and, and I'm, I'm assuming you haven't done any of this, so you might have done some of this. Probably the biggest problem I see is that most businesses, they're advertising, and I know that you're, you haven't been, but they are do start off advertising, but they don't have all the back end set up properly. So things like capturing your website traffic through pixels and setting up your conversion tracking and stuff like that. By collecting that audience, which is people who are coming to your website are going to either be, well, you would imagine doctors who might refer you or people who are interested in your product or people who are looking to use your product, even if they have come there, not through ads, start collecting that audience because whilst you might not have a big enough audience yet to um, create an audience on Facebook, over time you will. And then I would um, upload whatever database you do have, do an audience match and find people who have similar interests to those people who've been on your website in Australia or New Zealand or wherever you're targeting, and hopefully that would give you a big, big enough audience size without having to target like the um, audiences on Facebook specifically. Yeah. Is that kind of what you mean, or? Yeah, well, just trying to. What other alternatives can we be looking at um, other than Facebook? Other we've than got, okay, you know, we've got all of our pixels. We've got all the back end set up, but being a startup. We don't, as you said, we don't have the traffic yet and we can't use Facebook ads without spending it way too much money. The conversion sure. rate is just way too high um, yep. because we can't narrow it down at the moment because we're in the health sector. I mean, you could even, like, I've actually dabbled in Spotify ads. Or you could even look into things like, have you got a Pinterest account? Because you will get people who are, you know, having fertility issues, looking at different things on Pinterest, like recipes for infertility and da, da, da And you could actually sort of position yourself with Pinterest ads and they might be more effective. Uh, Bing ads are usually, or Microsoft ads are usually uh, more cost-effective than Google if you do want to try something that's a little bit different. 
Um, Google would probably be a really good place to start with ads. I think that'd be something that would be a product people would be searching for, not the product itself, but as in a solution. And yeah. the other thing I can highly recommend, and I know it sounds really old school, but for me, um, actually making connections with industry. So that's something that I've used in my strategy now, and it's um, building relationships with people in the fertility clinics or uh, have you heard of Business Networking International? No. So that's something, you know, you're either for it or you're not for it, but you essentially get to meet with other business people who use their connections to refer business to you so that you can make connections with people in your industry or the people, the industry that you're targeting. So I'd look at that sort of stuff. I'd look at the, um, is there, I'm sure there's like an association or um, something like that, that you could maybe join a board that you could go and meet people at networking events I think old school networking is really, really important as well. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. a few of those things I'm already doing, but yeah, I just wanted yeah, to yeah. call your thoughts on if you had anything outside of box, which you do. So that was brilliant. Thank you. That's okay. Thanks. <laughs> Can I just add another quick thought to that, which is that yeah. um, I'm a big believer in big borrow and steal other people's um, ideas. I'll stop. I'll say stop short of stealing other people's ideas. But what I mean is, go and find some brands that have done an amazing job at at that kind of early marketing piece that are you know related enough that they're comparable, and go and reverse engineer and just say what did they do that worked really well. Yeah, brilliant. There is one thing that I find works really really well is finding a search for an ambassador. So um, it might be a little bit hard because it's infertility and a lot of people might not want to do that but i'm thinking of it more from the jock side of things yeah <laughs> yeah we've got to be careful we are a registered medical device so we yeah. can't use influencers yeah um so otherwise we'll get into big trouble with tga yeah uh, but yeah there's now that we've started to get five year the fertility industry didn't want anything to do with me because oh. they didn't want to be the first ones to sort of step in and you know recommend it to their patients without the clinical trials even though we had had tga certification um, but now that we have gotten some claims through through private health funds they're now more open to having that discussion so i'm oh, good. now bombarding all the IVF clinics and fertility doctors with information and trying to get those those meetings happening so that's good and tga's just had some massive um updates to the online advertising rules so that's made it more difficult hasn't it yeah oh well okay great thank you, thank you. <laughs> thanks sarah um in the interest of time, I might move us on to our final speaker for today, who's Marin Eibner. So, Renee, thanks thanks for that. And if, if you are able to stick around, yep. um, that's great. We, we might have some time for other questions at the end. But mm -hmm. um, I'd like to now introduce Marin Eibner. Um, Marin's the customer engagement lead for SheMaps. Um, she's an entrepreneur, has been involved in a number of startups, and not just as a um, part of the team, but also as a program manager, having delivered startup programs at James Cook Uni and and several other um, international destinations that she might um, tell you about. Um, so, Marin, are you able to unmute and uh, we'll hand on to you? Yes, I should be unmuted uh, if you can hear me. There you are. And Yep, gotcha. And do you want to share some stories? You're just going to Yes, I'll share my screen if I find the right one. Brilliant. Okay. Is that coming through all right? Yep. Perfect. Let me get rid of the black bars. There we go. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. And um, yeah, sorry for coming a bit late to the party. Um, I, I got caught up with a dentist appointment uh, with my little one. So I'm um, sorry I missed the start of it. And I know it's Thursday afternoon, so I won't keep everyone too long. I know you're probably hanging for a glass of wine. Um, I just really excited to be sharing some insights um, into, um, yeah, some of the 
some of the early stages from business uh, from idea to to startup and um, and some of the insights that I've sort of gathered from working with startups over the years. Um, but first, I'll introduce myself a little bit and thank you, Colin. You've already done a bunch of that, so that's great. Um, yeah, so I'm Maren. That's me. <laughs> I'm sure you can see me anyway. Um, yeah, so I met Colin uh, through my previous work at James Cook University um, at the JSC Ideas Lab, uh, which is a startup and innovation center. And amongst other programs, we delivered the um, Startup on Ramp Pre Accelerator program. Uh, that's how I met Colin, and that's how I also met Renee, with, um, along with probably about 30 other early startup um, founders. Uh, then since then, um, I've also been doing a little bit of work with Tribe Global Ventures. Uh, I've been taking um, founders, startup and scale up founders to the UK um, on trade missions, and I have also been organizing some offsides there. My day job, um, as Colin said, I'm looking after marketing and sales for a STEM education provider. And I also do some sales and marketing consulting and project management work with my company, Make It Happen. And on top of that, maybe I'm a little bit crazy, but I'm uh, also right now <laughs> launching a apparel and mental well-being brand called Mindwolf. Uh, so I'm kind of back in your shoes in the early, early stages of ideating and launching something. Um, it was actually been really good putting this together because it reminded me of some of the pitfalls that I'm actually falling into right now as well, uh, to some extent. Um, and you might be saying, okay, where's the work-life balance there? Because it's all work, work, work. Um, so I am a mum of two. And I'm a stepmom of two um, as well. So that's our crazy bunch. The six of us, uh, they keep me on my toes and they are the balance to all the work as well. So now that you know a little bit more about me, um, let's get into it. So some of the common pitfalls, misconceptions and lessons learned uh, when bringing an idea to life. So I've got, I've got seven points um, and some of them may be repetition of what you've already heard um, from Colin and from Renee. I do apologize if that's the case, um, but sometimes, you know, hearing it over and over um, sometimes makes things stick a little bit more. So uh, first up, I guess the first question to ask is, um, are you building a startup or a small business? And a common misconception there is that a startup and a small business are uh, the same things, but they, they're actually not. Um, so the key difference uh, really lies in that startups um, have much higher growth potential than small businesses. Um, they're often focused on developing a product or service that can be scaled quickly and that have really large market potential. And so to achieve this, most startups are tech businesses or tech, at least tech enabled. Um, and small businesses, on the other hand, they typically have limited growth potential because they're focused on a specific local market instead. So uh, to give an example, a friend of mine, Lou, she was really bad at baking, but she had three kids. Um, and, you know, the pressures that we have when we host birthday parties and the cake has to be the wow factor. Um, well, she felt those pressures, but she didn't want to spend a lot of money on um, buying cakes for hundreds of dollars um, and she couldn't find a solution online so she she um, took her expertise as a engineer and as an interior designer and she started designing DIY cake kits um, and they're affordable and they're easy to make and she started selling them online um, as an e-commerce business uh, and a few years on now she's reaching customers all around Australia and New Zealand she's making like six figures uh, every year she's also just expanded into the U.S. Um, and she's also just um, expanded, I guess, from the physical, from the limitations of a physical, selling a physical product uh, online. She's now sort of even scaled uh, a little bit further by creating uh, templates and downloadable, downloadable instructions um, so she can virtually sell these um, all around the world. So that's kind of an example of building a, a scalable startup with high growth potential instead of, say, setting up a local custom cake business that only reaches a comparatively small market. But in saying that, not everyone needs to build a startup. Um, so, yeah, there is um, obviously um, quite a lot more 
capital that needs to be injected into a startup um, and you often trade off profitability uh, with high growth. So where a small business can start making a profit fairly quickly, um, a startup takes sometimes many years to, to turn a profit. So the, the investment is very different. So ask yourself, what are you planning to achieve? What is your risk adversity? Um, do you want to keep it small or big? And really understand the difference between the two. Then number two is misconception. Oh, sorry, number two, pitfall. Um, not talking about your idea or talking to people that are not your target market. So ask for feedback, but from the right people. So here, what I've seen a lot is that um, early stage founders or people that are in the ideating stage, they talk about their idea with their loved ones, with their friends and family, uh, and they don't necessarily get the right feedback. So, you know, they might be cheering on saying, yeah, yeah, that's a fantastic idea. That's so good. And in fact, it might not really be such a good idea at all. And sometimes it comes down to that they're just not the target market. Um, so really talk to people that actually have the problem that you are solving for. Number three is test your idea early. So um, some founders get caught up planning their business model to the point where they write business plans, marketing plans, have their logo designed, um, you know, get their car sign right with all sorts of things before they actually validate their idea. Um, and then some people get caught up in analysis paralysis and they spend um, lots of time and money, but not actually on testing the product. So um, I highly recommend gauging interest and commitment from your target audience really early. Um, so that can be a simple social media post, an online poll. Um, it could be a form to ask people to register pre-order um, or pre-purchase your product so one example that comes to mind here and i'm not going to say names but renee you probably know who i'm talking about um so there's an early stage founder that was in our um pre-accelerator and he was building an app for people that uh, loved hiking but didn't want to go um, by themselves and oh sorry um and so his his plan was to build an app um, and he, he put together a CTO, like a team of CTOs, uh, sorry, a, a CTO with a team of other techies that would build this app for him. And he hadn't actually really validated his idea yet. So as part of Startup on Ramp, he, um, he was forced to, to build an MVP. Um, he was a little bit reluctant about it, but he ended up creating a, um, a Facebook uh, group, like a community group. And he loved it. He got so much, um, he got so much out of it, like just talking to the people that would actually use his product um, and finding out, um, you know, people that would want to lead groups like that um, as well. So um, it's, it's really valuable to start small, um, start basic and really test, test your idea. And then another sentence I would add to that is not all problems are worth solving. Um, so I've, for example, a couple of weeks ago, we hosted an event with uh, Vu Train, a co-founder of Go One, $5 billion company. He also works as a GP still um, on the site twice a week. And um, he was sharing that it's very common in the health industry, um, you know, to still be using faxes. And he gets approached all the time by people that want to solve for that problem. Go, oh, what, what, are you, what are you doing? You're still using faxes. I'll build an app for that. And he's like, well, what's the point? Like. It works for us. No one is going to change from the model and the health industry is not going to move away from that. So what's the point um, changing it, disrupting the market? So really find out what problems are worth solving for as well. Okay, next one, number four. Um, work out who, oh, sorry, not wrong one. Um, the border, my target market the more likely I find enough people that need my product. So that's that's a common pitfall, going really broad as, as far as possible. But addressing a broad market runs the risk of diffusing your core product offering by attempting to solve too many problems. 
And, you know, we sometimes see that a company starts with solving one problem, they have one idea, and then they get approached by customers as well. You know, would you change your product a little bit and, and add this and this? Or, you know, would you, um, you know, make certain moderation and modifications or adaptions so I can use it in my industry? And, and often early stage businesses try to say yes to everything um, and be everything to everyone. Um, and that's a common pitfall because what happens is you lose focus and instead of being ultra disciplined and focused on your core product and getting that really right, um, you start going off into all these different tangents. So um, the guy on the right, everyone recognize him? Maybe not. Just imagine him without hair. Yes, it's Jeff Bezos, um, Amazon founder. So in 1994, he started selling books. Um, Amazon started, sold books for four years before they actually started selling CDs and electronics and toys uh, and things like that. Um, so, you know, don't be Amazon straight away. Start with a small segment and then build from there. So one rule of thumb that I've come across is start with one product with, for one market for one year and then you, you build from there. And then sort of building a little bit on that is my tip number five, work out who to market your product to. So a common pitfall is targeting the wrong person in the decision-making unit or not understanding the motivators of your target audience correctly. Um, so really find out who's the decision maker, who's the influencer and who's the buyer in the decision-making unit and what motivates them. So this mostly applies to B2B, business to business sales, but it can also apply to some consumer goods um, as well. And the only way you find out is by asking questions. So one example that comes to mind here is um, Albert. Um, he was part of the Startup on Ramp pre-accelerator as well. Um, he actually won it. Um, and he had a um, IoT sensor that measured the temperature of refrigerators and freezers in real time and provided an alert if the temperature dropped below a certain threshold. And the solution saved staff, like think hospitality staff, um, you know, kitchen staff, um, retail, um, supermarket staff, uh, a lot of time and paperwork because it replaced completing manual temperature logs. Um, and he had an MVP, he had a local butcher that he actually built the solution for. And he wanted to get into the hospitality market because it was a broader, a bigger market for him that he wanted to get into. Again, three started on ramp. Sorry, Colin, I'm giving a bit of a plug for the program. Um, he, he got pushed, like literally pushed by his mentor to go out and talk to his prospective customers. And he's not, he wasn't the type of person that was outgoing and a salesperson like he was the, the geeky tech guy that didn't really want to talk to anyone but he was forced and he was challenged to talk to 20 business owners restaurant owners and he went out there he started talking he he got brushed off people weren't interested in his device and he felt this heart and, and probably after the fifth or sixth person that he spoke to um, or could have been even more to be honest um, he started talking to a chef in the restaurant and the chef loved it like he was so sold by it was like that makes so much sense it saves us all these you know paper logs um saves us so much time it was such a hassle to do these paper logs and he worked out from there that he's got to talk to he's got to target the chefs and the kitchen hands in the business um to really sell his product not that they're the ones to buy the product but they're the ones influencing the person in the organization that would purchase the product. Um, and I just realized I didn't even skip my slide. So please next time, tell me. <laughs> um, okay, next one is um, give, give, give before you ask. So this is a really good tip that I, um, just come across from listening to Alex Homozi's um, recent book. I don't know if anyone read it. It's called a hundred million dollar leads. Um, I loved it. 
And it's one of his tips, um, his advice that he gives to business owners early on. Um, you know, he says, early on, build your business by giving your core product away for free. Well, in monetary terms for free, um, in exchange for feedback, reviews, testimonials, and really start building your use cases, get your Google reviews up, you know, get your five-star reviews um, and improve your value offering along the way and then start asking for payment and referrals, so on. So don't be shy to do stuff for free. And some people might tell you not to, and I'm not saying, you know, don't sell yourself under your value, but to start off, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to do things free of charge in return of the things that I just mentioned. And for some people, it's also a bit of a um, hesitation to charge for anything that they feel like, um, you know, they're not, they're not worth yet. So it can build your confidence as well, bringing a new product to market by actually running a few um, free cases. And then last but not least, I'm sure you've probably heard this. Maybe some of you heard this a million times, but um, my last tip is become comfortable with failing. Um, so one of the misconceptions um, that I come across quite a lot is failure is bad and should be avoided at all times. But in truth, yes, surely we don't like to fail. But when we build a business or we build a startup, we have to embrace failure and um, spin the mindset around um, and see early failure as a blessing in disguise. So it's all about embracing and accepting the thought that you will get things wrong inevitably. Um, but if you focus your resources on it early enough, you can get it right and then build a business that has a solid foundation on something that is actually really good. Um, yeah, so the bigger concern is investing years of time and money into a business that isn't designed to succeed. Um, so to become successful through early mistakes, run tests, gather user feedback through surveys, interviews, and keep refining your core product for your core market until you get it right. And with the right mindset, you can't lose from failure. You can either win or you learn. So those are the, the two key things. So to wrap it up in summary, don't confuse startup with small business. Do your research and find out what you want to build. Ask for feedback from the right people. Test your idea early. Start your minimum viable product and get lots and lots of feedback. Ask lots of questions. Work out who to market your product to. and start with a, a small segment. Sorry, I think that might be swapped around. I changed the order last minute. Um, still doesn't make it any less valuable. Um, and then number six, give before you ask. And seven, get comfortable with failing. So those are my seven, seven tips um, of the most common misconceptions and lessons learned uh, that I've come across uh, from you know working with early startup founders. And I hope you take some of this at home, take some of this home and maybe avoid making, um, not as a make of, avoid making those mistakes, but keep that in the back of your mind and maybe fast track your success by, um, by having those, um, those insights. And that's it. So, Happy to take any questions um, or open it up a little bit broader for any broader uh, discussions, anything that hasn't been discussed so far. Yeah, thanks, Maren. That was really valuable. Um, I might open it up for questions for, for Maren or Renee, if anyone's got any, any questions for either of you. I got one I for have you. a question. Oh, yeah, Sorry. go ahead. Um, and Andrea. Um, so my question is, if you want to find out if anyone else is doing this, so I have an idea. Um, I can see where it would be valuable, but where, how would I work out if anyone else is doing it? Like I have, while we've been sitting here, I've done a Google search and I can't find anything that fits um, what I'm looking for. 
But my experience is with things like Google searches that I already have a preconceived and my computer has a preconceived idea about what I'm <laughs> looking for. So, um, yeah, before I spend too much more energy or, or that kind of thing, how do I, where, where would you go, um, like to sort of find out about competition, I guess? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And look, you know, there's, there's so many businesses that are, that are being built and, um, you know, that start and some fail. And, uh, yeah, I, th I think Google search is like sort of the, the, the first one to go for and maybe being quite creative in different things to look for. Like there's, you know, probably different search terms that you can try and find, right. find out if something already exists. Yeah. Um, another one that I came across because my brain's always going, like I'm always thinking of ideas, like my latest thing is perforated mm -hmm. lasagna sheets. Like, why does no one ever make that? Like yes. every time I make lasagna, I'm like, why did it go into like 14 different pieces? Why does no one just perforate those things? Anyway, um, so I, um, search up apps sometimes on, you know, mm -hmm. the app platform and, um, yeah, like I was, I was thinking of, wouldn't it be so cool to have an app that really keeps you track, keeps you track on your goals and, you know, like a, a progress app. And I looked it up on, on the app store, there like 50 apps for that already. Mm -hmm. So yeah, an app, an app search sometimes, um, you know, can be really useful as well. It might not be picked up as much by, by Google. Um, Thank yeah. You. And then. I mean, another one, but you know, that's, that's really sort of a little bit, um, almost, you know, got to be, be lucky what you hear, but just taking part in, you know, the startup pitch events and, um, newsletters, like sort of finding out sort of what, what, what trends, right. but if it's something quite particular and, and sometimes it might just be putting it out on, on Facebook. Like if there is an idea you think or, or problem, no one is solving for, put it on Facebook, put it on, you know, whether it's a community group or, you know, your, your own network and put it out there and say, Hey, I'm, I'm experiencing this problem or I've heard someone is experiencing this problem. And there's no solution for it. Have you got the same problem or do you know what okay. solution yeah. could, could fix this? Yeah. Thank you. I don't yeah, know that you. you can add to yeah. that. Thanks. Thanks, Marin. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to pause we've got a few minutes Still yeah I've got a quick question for Marin hi Marin um I when you were um saying something around um who is the decision maker who is the influencer was there a third one that you said um the decision maker the influencer the buyer okay yeah I missed that one thank you yeah, sorry, there's usually there's there's the one using the product. Well, there's firstly the one influencing the, the purchase decision, and there's the one making the purchase. So there's the buyer. There's the influencer, the buyer, and then there's the consumer, the person actually using the product. Yeah. So in, in the example that I gave, the chef might be the influencer, the kitchen hand might be the user, and the restaurant owner might be the part, the buyer. Um, to actually make the purchase and you know in in larger b2b organizations you have a much more complex decision making unit so then you, sometimes you have the the cashier like the one you know some in bigger corporations you then have to take it to your finance team and they have to approve your budget expense separately again so it can become a bit more complex like in my work that i do with schools i see that quite a lot um i have a teacher that's super interested in the um you know the the drone education resources that we sell super keen to get started but the head of department is the blocker or the principal doesn't approve it or the principal approves it but the business manager says no we can't do it now it's got to be in six months time so it can be quite complex in especially government and um school organizations yeah yeah great thank you very much no worries i have a question yeah. Do you, do you have any tips? That's, that's so useful because when I think of business customers, it's like, it's like a huge thing to go with. Right. And then you're like, okay, hang on. Who's the influencer? And that's such a good point. Do you have any tips on how to possibly find influencers within a business? 
Yeah, I th- it's such I a broad it's, question, um, but I guess even broad tips would work. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It, it is a broad question, but it's a really important question. And I believe you won't find out until you start talking to firstly, who you think your customer is, start talking to them. What are their pain points? What are you solving for? What are they experiencing? What is stopping them from making a purchase? And sometimes it's a little bit detective work to kind of find out who's, who's the one influencing the decision, who's the one blocking the decision. And sometimes we have to write our marketing message differently to, you know, address the influencer or overcome the blocker. Like, again, sorry to bring it back to my school example, but um, like I said, I, I work with teachers. Um, teachers are super, super keen to use the education resources that we have because we make their lives so much easier. Like we have ready to plug and play teaching materials for teachers and teachers love that. But it comes down to the cost factor. Um, so we provide as much information to the teacher, as much compelling arguments why that is a good purchase to make it easier for them to then in turn influence the business manager or the head of department. Um, so we bring out all the reasons why teaching with drones is such a good idea and why they really should get onto it. And sometimes thinking a little bit ahead and thinking, what would the leadership team want to hear? Well, teaching with drones makes the school a lot more competitive compared to other, other schools. You know, you're teaching 21st century skills, you're teaching, teaching with the technology of the future, etc. Speaking the language that will sort of overcome those barriers, I believe you can only do that once you talk one-on-one with your target audience and, and get those deep insights. And whether that's focus groups or surveys, sort of find out what, what sort of works and and how, where you get the responses from. Thank you. Very, very helpful. Thanks, Marin. I'm conscious of time. I I know that everyone um, has a life that they need to get back to. And we did say that we'd wrap it up about now. But um, before we do, I just wanted to see if Marin and Renee had any final parting thoughts or words of wisdom to leave everyone with before we do wrap up. No, I just, you know, applaud everyone who's going out there and, you know, having an idea and taking it to business and you know, Renee, you can probably speak to that a lot more than me, what it takes to stay strong and get through the roller coaster. But I just applaud all of you. Even actually one last thought is do what you're doing right now, like get onto webinars, join the community, find your own startup community, become a part of that because it's so much easier to do it with someone, especially when you feel the pains, you feel the stressfulness um, and you can share that with someone. So um, you know, having places like innovation centers or joining programs like the ones that, you know, Colin brought to life, um, pre-accelerator programs, accelerator programs down the track. I think they're invaluable. Like that is your, your best bet for success is doing it in a community. Um, for, for me, I would say every time you feel like giving up, as long as you're not going to lose your house, <laughs> keep pushing through because it's like just as you push through and you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I didn't give up because that's when something happens and you're happy that you can continue going. And it's like everyone else gives up when you continue. And that's what sets you apart. That's sort of what I've I've always thought. But as long as you're not going to lose your house, you haven't invested too much. <laughs> Thanks, Renee. That's uh, pretty solid advice there definitely don't lose your house but yeah persistence yeah. <laughs> is, persistence is definitely the name of the game yeah um, I, i'm going to wrap it up I, I will just put one link in the chat which is to our founders course which covers some of the topics that we've been talking about tonight so if anyone hasn't yet had a look at that it, it's something that's worth checking out I'll, I'll email a link around to that as well but can i just thank um, both renee and Marin for joining us it's been really valuable to, to pick your brains and um uh, get some insights into the things that you've learned in your own founder journeys um and thanks everyone for joining in i know it's uh you know a big chunk of time out of your day so i really appreciate you um joining into the conversation um if anyone's got any other questions or things that we didn't get to um feel free to email me i'll i'll, I'll get in touch with you to share this recording and also some of the links that people have put in but feel free to get in touch if there's anything that we didn't get to and um Yeah. Thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it, everyone. Thanks, everyone.
Have a good one. Yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.